Anyway, what this is about is the myth of culture, which is a nice catchy phrase. And um, it's, I call it the myth of culture because people regard culture as being, oh, well, this culture is good. And 10 years ago, they, they continue to think that it's the same culture. And in fact, it typically is not. So, uh, you know, Subtitle is why things aren't the way they used to be. Get off of my lawn. And uh, what you can do about it if it's not too late. And I'm going to keep an eye on the chat for any questions, which I uh, reserve the right to uh, ignore at my discretion. So uh, I got to click on the right screen over here, don't I? Dunk. Yeah. What exactly do I mean by culture? I don't mean this. Okay, not that kind of culture. Talking about the kind of culture of people working together. So a collection of, of beliefs, ethics, behaviors, and um, things that are acceptable and that people have expectations of each other that a particular group um, has agreed upon um, consensually. Now, consensus means everybody has. And if you really want to know, there's a little, little blurb at the bottom saying what consensual means and where it comes from right down to the Latin. But I'm not going to uh, get into that. Basically, the, the, the culture for an organization is something that everybody has bought into. Okay? If they have, people haven't bought into it, well, they're outliers and not really part of the culture, so we can afford to ignore them for now. I, I will welcome questions at any point, but uh, you know. how does a culture form? Uh, probably as many different ways as there are cultures. They've, they've, you know, whether you're talking about uh, the culture of a community uh, in a village or in people in an office or people in an organization uh, at a company or what we're focusing on here is mostly um, organizations that people who get together to work on a common project, such as code or documentation or video games or whatever. And it, let's assume that it grows out of the informal ways in which a small group of people actually um, became comfortable working with each other. You know, they started emailing each other and uh, or, or visiting each other or chatting and over time developed uh, expectations of each other. Like nobody's going to insult each other. And uh, if you want to make a change to the code, you know, this is, this is the way everybody does it. Um, and um, so that's, that's, that's how it grows. Uh, and they may say, okay, well, let's make this formal. We're going to, we are going to treat each other with respect. Our goal is to build this this project or or, or whatever, um, and um, don't be evil. Be excellent to each other. And unless you're building a toxic culture or have a toxic culture, um, two of the basic ideas should be uh, implicitly reciprocal trust and respect. Another what it. In other words, anybody else who is, shares the culture with you, you should respect them because they are a member of your culture. And at least to a certain extent, you should trust them for the same reason, and they should trust you. So. Now, why is culture a myth? Uh, the tagline, uh, the, 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 the clickbait, if you will, for this session, um, is that it, it's, it's not really a myth. The myth is that uh, whatever it started out being, uh, it'll remain forever. You know, for instance, uh, speaking from personal experience at Apache, we had a small number of people working on the web server, and we had um, the way we did things. We kind of called the Apache way, and uh, we never actually 
codified it. Uh, but as Apache grew, um, for reasons I'll explain shortly, um, things didn't quite, uh, other people, it wasn't universally shared. It was not a consensual uh, culture. So, uh, so the myth is that once you set it up, it's going to take care of itself. Everybody will abide by it. You never have to worry about it. 10 years down the road, you can refer to it. Everybody will know what you mean. Um, not so. So we had our small group of people from the last slide who built their culture. They hammered out the details and their, comp their compromises and their expectations and how they were going to work together and what their behaviors were going to be. Um, and they were happy with it. So bingo. They formed their culture. Whether they, they all agreed to live by it. They all knew what each other meant, hopefully. Now, what threatens such a culture? Um, lots of things. Um, but some of the, some of the big ones um, are growth. Each of these I'll, I'll cover separately. But, you know, the, the, the members of the culture growing, there being more people added, uh, attempts to either diversify it or diversity coming through uh, who ends up joining the culture. And of course, uh, trying to do things like going public or incorporating, um, that can be a threat to a culture. Again, once again, speaking about uh, the open software sort of thing. Um, other things that can, that can threaten it is um, sacrificing control over it uh, or diluting it. Uh, usually these will cover also. And people who are part of the original founding group um, leaving it uh, uh, and thereby taking with them their, their um, keepers of the flame responsibility or possibly they were going out to lunch and they got run over by a stampede of buses. So anyway, that wisdom, the shared wisdom is no longer available. That, is, that threatens the culture they built. Okay. Why can growth be a threat? As new people become part of the group, they are basically told, here is the culture. Um, it's, this is how we set it up. This is what you have to live with. Um, as I said, it's been forced, the anvil's cold, uh, and these new people had no part in its making, and it may be completely foreign to the background that they have. For instance, um, somebody coming to work on the web server project at Apache who has a background as an accountant would probably find things um, very confusing and have a complete disconnect uh, between his expectations and background and experience and what the culture was at the, at the project. Um, or some place that had a, a company that had people that had assigned to work on a project um, that had very strict lines of reporting and uh, rules in place might find that um, coming to work for the project put them at a, uh, a disadvantage because they would have to violate the uh, rules that are internal to their employer. So um, that's why I think getting bigger can be a threat because you've got, you've got people who are coming into the culture who don't have the shared background with the people who created it. And until, <clears throat> and until they, there's something wrong with this water, until they um, actually <clears throat> buy into the culture, um, they're going to be applying their unconscious biases, which may cause them to be at odds with what's going on with everybody else. Now, why can't diversity be a threat? Uh, much along the same lines as um, growth. And if you have a goal for diversity, um, you're adding people in order to make the reach some sort of goal, like making sure you have 50% of, of uh, 
males and females, or you want to have at least a representation from um, n different ethnic groups or n different countries. Um, but um, however you define diversity, you can be adding problems because uh, there be there may be areas of confusion, there may be some areas of resentment. You know, people thinking they're being added as tokens, um, and that, or actually after being after joining, being treated uh, as not as equals. So it's sort of just. Um, the social disruptions we're experiencing in the United States today, you want to definitely want to avoid that if you're going to be doing anything with diversity in your organization. And other things I might uh, add that would be, might be in it unanticipated um, is, for instance, languages. Um, new people coming in may not have share the same first language that the um, people already there or the originators had. So you have to allow for explanations uh, and misunderstandings and words that mean different things to different people. They may be, uh, there, there may be um, social backgrounds that you uh, are aware of that will affect how things work. Um, or ethnic ones, or even just um, plain old time. So uh, let me back up here. I don't know if I went into any more detail on this or not, but um, let's see, behavioral. Um, for instance, in certain countries, uh, the where I have given presentations and I've given hundreds of them, the the social norm at a conference is for uh, questions to be left to the end. Um, even if the speaker says, anybody have any questions, the people will remain silent and wait until the end. Um, others, um, people will stick up their hands or uh, ask their questions either when they when the speaker says anybody has any questions or um, as things progress. Unfortunately, uh, you can see me, but I can't see you. So if you've got your hand up, too bad. Uh, the, uh, the temporal issue, um, you know, I've done a lot of uh, writing and working on this. Uh, it's, we've become accustomed to instant gratification. Uh, send mail, expect an answer. Um, back in 1987, I think it was, um, I was on the phone with, I was in uh, Massachusetts. And I was on the telephone with a friend in Washington, DC, and I sent him an email. And a few minutes later, while we were talking, I heard it beep on an arrival, and we were both astonished at how fast it got there. So I earned these white hairs here. Uh, nowadays, we expect you send the, you expect it to arrive in seconds. Now, the way things go, the, the problem with the instant gratification aspect is you send the message, you don't hear a reply, you wonder, okay, why? And if it's if it's something contentious. You find yourself getting worked up and worked up, and you send another message, and there's no right reply to that. And in very short order, it can turn into a flame storm when, in fact, your correspondent is on the other side of the planet and is currently in bed. And she's going to wake up and see her inbox is full of um, flames, and then she's going to get upset and flame right back. And, of course, you're asleep at this point, so it just goes back and forth. So that's a, that's another way that diversity can cause problems, and you need to keep all these things in mind. That's why um, a lot of groups have added. You know, before we make any decisions, we got to wait at least forty-eight hours to allow everybody who is 
around the world to actually get to a computer and see what's going on, uh, or in, for some things that are um, longer view, like votes, we'll give, give people a week just in case they're off on holiday somewhere. Uh, question, assuming that diversity is a threat, should we expect that in future, people will rather tend to create smaller communities instead of big ones as it happened for hundreds of years? Well, that's, um, as Christopher Dutt says, a threat, we're talking about a threat to an existing culture, not necessarily fixed, but existing. Um, there is always, it's, it's part of the human condition that there is us and them. There is those who are us and the others. Now, if you remember back to your days in, in preschool, you'll probably remember that which side of those you might happen to have been on. Uh, it's built into us. And so um, correcting, making allowances for it and correcting it has to be a conscious decision. And we are rational beings, most of us anyway. Um, and we should think about what we do rather than just doing it without thought because that's our lizard brain talking and lizards tend to fight a lot. Uh, if the culture evolves with the community, diversity shouldn't be an issue, right? Mm, yes and no. I'll come, I'll come to that. That's towards the end. Any other, any other questions at this point? All right, moving on. Why can going public be a threat? Well, um, first thing is, you know, by becoming a public, publicly traded company, uh, you've basically accepted a new set of masters. Um, you've got uh, government regulators in possibly more than one country. If you've gone public in terms of issuing stock, you've got the stockholders. Um, and you've got possibly appointees. For instance, uh, if you went public and with venture capital, your venture capitalists are going to want seats on your board, and they may not have the least idea or the least care for your culture. They may be um, there to make a buck. Um, and this, this can include uh, just incorporating um, and not actually going public. You know, the Apache Software Foundation is not a, a stock issuing organization, but it is a corporation. Uh, and unless it's done carefully, uh, it's, there is the potential for interests that do not share the cultures, do not share the culture, uh, might end up in policy making places uh, such as on the board and start to steer things to their own advantages rather than the advantage of the group. Any, any questions here? All right, now what can sacrifice and control be a threat? Well, uh, that is another, um, there, there are, The last couple of decades are littered with um, the bodies of uh, corpses, dried up, desiccated corpses of companies and startups that um, ended up inadvertently or for being forcibly required to sacrifice some of their control. Um, for instance, again, as I mentioned, uh, venture capitalists, you got a suit on your board, you might get you know a million dollars. Um, and if you want to see an example of how that ruined uh, a particularly well thought of organization, um, just look up uh, Philip Greenspun Ars Didita, and you'll get from his perspective um, what happened. He started a, he started a company. It was well thought of. Um, venture capitalists came in to, to fund them and he ended up being thrown out and the product was uh, product tanked and it's a, it's a 
a typical story. I've heard uh, many of them. That's one that sticks out in my mind. Uh, so be careful if you be careful that your leaders are inculcated and devoted to the culture, and that people who aren't uh, cannot get into a position of leadership. That's the lesson to be learned from this. I mentioned dilution. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, all things I mentioned, I, I mentioned things in the plural. I mentioned you know behaviors and uh, expectations and ethics. And uh, dilution refers to abiding by the, the rules of the culture selectively rather than wholly, and sometimes um, replacing or adding things that aren't uh, part of the main understanding or main definition of the culture. Um, this couldn't happen um, un unconsciously through expedience. You know, somebody's not here. We're supposed to run this by him. I mean, he's he's in the hospital, so um, let's just do it. And if uh, a person's in the hospital long enough, then it becomes the norm to just do things without checking with him. Um, another way uh, is um, failing to educate those newcomers, the people who don't have the background in your culture. Um, they don't know. If they don't know what the procedures are, if they haven't been taught them, they may fill in the blanks themselves. And if there are enough of them, they may uh, outnumber the, the old timers, if you will, and develop a new way of doing things that is in conflict with the, uh, the cultural norm, just because there's so many of them. You know, we had, uh, We've had some problems like that uh, at Apache, uh, and I'm sure other organizations have had it as well. But uh, diluting is, as the organiza organization gets larger and larger, um, oversight tends not to keep up with it. And so on the outer fringes, people are joining, and nobody's really sure. The farther away you get from the center, the, the less uh, sure you are that the uh, the standards of the culture are being maintained and that everybody is buying into the same thing. Um, so back to that goes back to gro growth being growth and dilution. These are all tied together. Okay, oops, I gotta click on the right right screen here. All right, preserving it. Giving all the possible, and I've only covered a few of them. I mean, you <clears throat> left as an exercise to the listener slash reader. Um, given all the all the ways that the culture can lose coherency, uh, consider building in some 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 checks and balances. Um, for instance, when uh, new people come in to the to whom the culture is completely foreign, or even if they're slightly aware of it, don't just educate them. Give them the opportunity to provide feedback and listen to them. They're coming from a different point of view. Um, so don't assume you're always right. They may have something to contribute that will actually improve uh, the culture. So it should not be an our way or the highway thing. If somebody comes in and they have an uh, idea how things could be better and make things easier for them without hurting anybody else, Pay attention. Um, what we're, we're, we're working towards is being inclusive, not exclusive. And <clears throat> to get their buy-in, consider how you can change their attitude so they're they're not saying, "Okay, I'm joining this culture." Give them some sort of um, investment in it so they can say, "This is going to be my culture." And that way they have an interest in preserving and defending it. Uh, and make sure that the uh, leaders of any internal sub-organizations are aware of what the culture is and they are watchable for preserving it within their own, you know, bailiwicks. So if, uh, for instance, at Apache, we've got 
projects and the people in the leadership teams of the projects should be aware of what the Apache way is and ensure that the project functions according to it. Now, um, the Apache way is an interesting thing. There's a, there was a book that um, was going around for a number of years at Amazon called uh, The Apache Way. And a number of people were signed up to write it. I was one of them. Uh, Jim Jagelski was somebody else. Uh, and um, I don't know if it ever actually got published, uh, but it had like half a dozen people signed up to author it. And it, uh, it was very hard to, to actually codify. So I don't know if it ever got written. And that is a problem. If you, it, it's gotta be, uh, go beyond, uh, well, you, you'll know it when you see it. It's like, um, I don't know good art, but I know what I like. That's not sufficient. You've got to actually have something you can point to and say, this is how the culture works. This is not. And um, that means listening. I mentioned listening to newcomers because they have a different perspective, but it also means listening to um, the existing members because um, internet time is very fast and things are changing for everybody all the time. And things that worked 10 years ago may not work now, which means the culture may need to adapt. So everybody needs to keep an eye on it and see way and watch for ways to improve it, watch for ways in which it is no longer applicable or even um, obstructs uh, the uh, purpose of the organization. So everybody is responsible for curating the continuation of the culture. The people who are already there, new people, the leaders, um, everybody needs to know it. Everybody needs to be invested in it. And everybody needs to have the responsibility of keeping it intact. Oh. Now, defending it. Um, Thomas Jefferson wrote, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Well, um, that's fine for a country, but I don't know that any startup in Silicon Valley should really um, adopt this as their as their motto. Maybe some out there who actually have, but um, let's uh, let's not think about that. This is a bad year in the United States. Yeah. So um, let's not go that far, but we can still defend it in other ways. So as I said, ensure that new participants become invested and become part of the consensus, the universal agreement to uh, accept and go along with whatever the, the culture is. Now, how you want them to be invested is up to you. I've suggested, you know, listening to them. I've uh, I didn't suggest, but um, showing them how things work you know why is the why do we do things this way well somebody who's sufficiently educated in their culture can say well we do things this way it has worked as in this example this is how it worked this is how it resolved an issue um if we did it any other way there would have been a problem would have gone on for years the bug would have gone out there and so forth and so on and in fact make sure that any newcomers are on board with the culture before letting them in. Um, it kind of, this might kind of sound like, you know, you're indoctrinating them or, or, or initiating them or possibly even brainwashing them. What you're doing is you're mentoring the future members that are going to comprise the future of the organization. You're, you're not necessarily making them your clones, but you're getting them to understand what hopefully you, have under, you understand and what the people who originally formed the culture understood. So you're bringing them along, um, making them your apprentice, if you will, so that when the time comes, they can bring along somebody else. So other ways to defend it. Well, as we uh, question, what would mean admitting the case of an Apache project, ASF project? project. Um, 
Mm, giving commit access. Probably would be the uh, one of the one of the bars for admitting who they they've followed the rules. They've you know they they've done things they've done things that everybody has been happy with, and there's been a vote: is this person um, you know suitable? They do things the right way. Are they gonna are they going to maintain our way of doing things? If they are, then um, you can, you can accept them. Of course, if their code is great and their attitude sucks, um, then you got a problem. You got to resolve yourself. <laughs> and we have had there there have been some cases like that uh, at the ASF. Yeah. So one of the things where um, I think the ASF has not followed through as well as it could have was this one: codify the culture. Write it down, publish it, make it as prominent on your website as possible. Make it detailed, especially with regards to ethics. And um, you know, get the you know, if necessary, you know, have to get a, a lawyer to provide some advice so you don't uh, uh, you don't you don't end up giving legal advice that is going to get you in trouble. But some things that um, should be made plain uh, uh, right up front. And here is an example: you know, private email messages, and that includes messages to private lists, things that you won't find archived publicly. Uh, shall not be made, shall not be shared, nor made public without the express permission of all the correspondents on the original message. Now, um, so that's basically to. Uh, block. Well, you know, it kind of sounds like you're trying to block whistleblowers, um, but it's possible for a whistleblower to identify an issue without actually quoting things. Uh, hopefully, again, we're not the government and um, eh, we'll be reactive. Yeah. No ad hominem attacks. You know, if you if you attack someone personally more than end times then your email privileges will be suspended or whatever um, that doesn't have to, that doesn't have to be explicitly part of the uh, cultural definition but the no personal tax does what happens if somebody violates the rules that's a separate issue yeah now reference this thing frequently as I said make it public uh, make everybody aware of it um, have I don't know remedial training. Once you, once you, if your organization already has a culture and you haven't done this stuff, write it up and um, make sure that all the current participants are on board with it. You know, um, some companies have an annual, you know, ethics training, so they have to go through this thing and sign off. Yes, I understand all this stuff. I've taken the test. Um, I will behave ethically. Um, I don't know that you need to go that far, but if some at Apache there's the uh, the uh, individual contributor license agreement, and um, that I think would everybody who's going to have commit access to the code has to sign one of those, and it wouldn't be a bad idea uh, in my mind um, if there were a clause saying I agree to abide by the Apache way as specified in such and such a location. Yeah. We currently don't because we don't have the location and we don't have that in the uh, li contributor license agreement, but I think it would be a good thing uh, and other people can get there before Apache does. That'd be good. Um, and make sure that new people, again, education, make sure they're aware of the cultural definition and what their responsibilities are and what their authorities are, including calling out violations. There should be, um, you know, somewhere instructions. If you see somebody violating this, what do you do? Again, not necessarily part of the definition itself, but it is part of, you know, the, the rules and policies that you're going to need to protect your culture. You need to have ways uh, to 
address issues to find somewhere. Otherwise, you're winging it every time, and that can, you know, well, you didn't do it for him. At least that way lies madness. Now, as I, uh, number four here, I already mentioned, uh, I, I agree to abide by, put that in there somewhere. Um, and the last one I also mentioned, what do you do with, um, if somebody doesn't abide by the, the cultural rules, somebody, somebody who does uh, publish private email, an example, or does attack somebody personally, how many times and what happens? You know, set out those rules. They're not part of the culture. They're part of the framework of protection you're building around the culture to maintain it and keep it safe. Uh, and basically, you want it to be easy to follow. You don't want to have, you know, something that's so complex that uh, um, people have to, ref you know, continually refer to it. You know, so cultural definitions should be fairly small in, in scope. They should be, I don't know, maybe a couple of pages at most. Personal opinion. And that is the end of this presentation. There are the ways you can you can reach me. And in terms of about me, I've been writing code for more than 40 years. Uh, I've been using, I've been part of uh, Apache since um, 1990, winter of 1995-96. Um, I was one of the founders of the Apache Software Foundation. It's on the board of directors of the Open Source Initiative. I worked for IBM and Red Hat and uh, General Dynamics and the University of Massachusetts, among other places. I can't count the number of languages I've learned to write in, um, but it's been at least a dozen. Right now, I mostly use Ruby. And um, I feel very strongly about this stuff um, that people are building things ways of working together without realizing how fragile they are um, and how susceptible they are to subordination or corruption by outside influences um, there's always a new project coming up with it with a new you know subculture or their own unique culture and um i think they're 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 sharks in the water that they don't know about so um my point of this is to you know say look shark call roy Scheider. so anybody have any final questions from me anything you think i should have covered that i didn't or disagreements with uh what i said I'm going to watch the chat here, see if anybody says anything. Diane Hardman said, if it's not referenced frequently, updated, and enforced, it will die. Well, either die or become a dead letter. Same thing. <coughs> Water is supposed to clear your throat, not choke you. <coughs> Question, does the Apache Software Foundation monitor project group discussions to call out violations to ASF guidelines? Um, well, the uh, project management committees are on the, members of the project management committees, PMCs, are on the development mailing lists uh, where those group discussions take place. Um, and so in, in broad, the answer to that should be yes, but there are a couple of modula to this. One is, um, the last I saw, we don't have any hard and fast ASF guidelines. Um, and um, it depends on whether the, the, the PMC, all the individuals of the PMC are, educated in the Apache way. And things have gone on so long and things have gotten so big that um, 
there have been some cases where clearly that the, the Apache way got lost in translation and uh, drastic steps had to be taken. You know, people kicked out or um, whatever. So yes, an answer, you answered your own question. It's up to the PMCs to be the monitors for their products. And it's up to the, the board to monitor the uh, projects through the quarterly report from the, the vice presidents in charge of the projects. And of course, a lot of the members of the board are on uh, multiple uh, development mailing lists. So they should uh, be able to spot it and, and raise the issue. Again, those are discussions that are going to happen in private. They're going to have it on the on the project's private mailing list or on the board's private mailing list because you don't um, put it this way: you uh, you don't don't talk about an active inve investigation. Did I answer your question, Diane? Yes, good. Anybody else have any questions? How am I doing, Sharon? So I think this is getting recorded, which means that somebody is probably going to try and blow up the background of my uh, screen here and try and figure out what books are on my shelves over there. So good luck with that. I'm waiting for Rich or Sharon or somebody to tell me to to sort off. So otherwise, I'll continue to schmooze and answer your questions if anybody else has any or suggestions. I mean, did you anybody think of anything that I should have included in this slide deck that I did not? Another one place where doing this, doing it this way, takes a lot longer than uh, it has it. It's mixed. It takes longer for somebody to reply as they're typing. Uh, on the other hand, it goes into hard copy. Whereas if somebody raised their hand and said something, somebody would have to take notes in, in order to get it to me to put it in, or I'd have to take notes. Is it a goal for Apache to have more diversity of participants? Um, I'm not in a position where I can speak for uh, Apache, and I assume you're talking about the ASF as a whole. Um, but I don't believe that diversity is a goal. I think um, individuals may have that as a goal, and that there are some people that, for instance, try to encourage more women to uh, join. But I think the foundation's goal is merely to be open. So not uh, be inclusive, and open, and not uh, discriminatory or exclusive. What positive changes have I seen to the culture through my years with Apache? To the Apache culture? Um, Well, I think it has been a force, I'm not sure I consider it a change, but I consider it to have been a force for good in demonstrating a way that um, people can collaborate. I mean, the original, uh, original project was the web server project, and we had people from Europe and California and elsewhere all around the, uh, the the US who pretty much never saw each other. They managed to work together. Uh, they got together at one point, uh, minus me, and went mountain climbing, uh, which I guess was kind of like a, 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 a walkabout hackathon for whatever they talked about. Um, 
So I think that it's, it's setting an example uh, and seeing people follow the example, I think, is a positive change. Do I think that ASF culture requires some level of age or experience from newcomers? Uh, I'm not sure age or experience is the right word. Let's say uh, maturity and um, thoughtfulness and commitment. Um, people, just as there's uh, an age of consent because um, human brains don't spring full blown their full capacity and understanding uh, there it, it takes a while before people are for humans are really ready to take responsibility for themselves um, but uh, I think that the culture requires people to uh, understand what is expected of them and I think that can come at almost any age well uh, understand what is expected of them and um, have the commitment to follow through on it let's put it that way So a you know one, I, one of these people who uh, finished MIT at um, age twelve um, I wouldn't be sure about because I'm not sure that uh, well if he's managed to finish MIT that means he's had the commitment and the understanding of the expectations of him in order to get his coursework done. So I withdraw that remark. Any other questions? What are my thoughts on cultures built around programming language impacting cultural mores built around programming languages impacting the culture. Uh, which culture? Do you have one in mind? And you're, you're, you're referring to um, the cultural mores based on language um, coming into and you know, impacting an existing culture. Oops, I think I need to fix my. Oh, like coming in with a disdain for Java. Um, um, well, like people kind of have people kind of have disdain, but they need to have tolerance too. That should be one. Of, that's a good one. I should add tolerance to the uh, to the list. For instance. Um, yeah, are you are you calling me out uh, deliberately because I don't do Java? I uh, I was interested in Java when it came out, but uh, before I really got into it, it turned into a religion, and I backed away slowly, avoiding uh, eye contact. And I haven't uh, for a long time there. Um, you know, whatever the problem was, Java was the answer, and that totally hit me wrong. Uh, so if somebody has disdain for um a language one of uh multiple languages that are in use in a project um fine but let them keep it to itself let them keep it to themselves um they shouldn't be tolerant of the people who don't share their point of view 
if they don't like Java, they don't, shouldn't work on any of the Java projects and shouldn't comment on how they're done except at a, uh, a high level that is language independent would be my, my thoughts. Now, if they're coming into a project where everything is Java and they don't like Java, um, well, um, maybe they're so smart in their uh, uh, 10,000 foot evaluations and, and architecture that uh, you can put up with their snark, but um, in that case, I'd probably uh, sequester them into a separate group where the all the discussions were at 10,000 feet and not about the actual implementation in Java, so that uh, the Java snark wouldn't reach and annoy the people actually writing the code. If they wanted to uh, opt into that uh, 10,000 foot discussion list where there is this disdainful chap that would have to be opt-in and they'd have to know what they're getting into. It's it's all highly situational. These are just my thoughts off the top of my head. And as you can see, there's not a lot up here. All this, this used to be my hair, but it moved south and gave me a good flossing on the way. So that, that, by the way, folks, was uh, Drew Folks. Uh, you like the lack of filter. Um, please e explain with a little more context. That was from Steven Snyder. Oh, no hair. <laughs> well, this still filters my soup. Oh, anybody else have any comments or questions? Unfortunately, this uh, this platform doesn't allow me to see who's actually in the session. So I don't know whether uh, the organizers are, are here to uh, tell me when I should uh, go away or or what. Rich, Sharon, Dave Fisher says, thank you. You're very welcome. And I hope that uh, this has proved thoughtful, thought provoking, if not instructive. And at the very least, I hope it hasn't wasted anybody's time. Considering it is now 10 minutes of five East Coast time, that's probably uh, time some stomachs are rumbling. So I guess I'll I'll give this uh, two more minutes, and if nobody else say anything, says anything, I'll uh, I'll sign off. Uh, incubator needs a refresh based on my thoughts. Um, that would be the incubator would be an excellent place for a lot of this stuff to happen. Um, so I don't know how much of it actually does happen. Um, so I'll agree with the sentiment without uh, having uh, direct knowledge of whether I agree or not. What it really needs is uh, some people to write up the, the documentation, actually document what what the expectations and behaviors are, uh, what the, and get buy-in from from everybody, like a vote on members. This is the codification of the Apache way. Uh, the tragedy of System D. I have. Uh, Ah, okay, regarding contempt of culture. 
I'll have to I'll have to look at that later. I have mixed emotions about System D myself. On the one hand, it uh, I, I found it useful for tying things together and happen in a particular order. Uh, on the other hand, it seems to go against uh, the, the Unix-ish um, approach of small things working together. And um, being more monolithic than otherwise, but I have no investment. All right, I will. I will look at that, Drew. Thank you. You say contempt culture. You mean a contempt for culture or a culture of contempt for others? Ah, hi, Gavin. <laughs> well, obviously, there's an in, there's a inside joke there. That I'm not I'm not getting so. <sighs> yeah, the culture of contempt. Um, that seems that seems baked into a lot of things. Um, for instance, there was a widespread culture of contempt, uh, not specific to any particular organization, um, about Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft does not appear to be quite as universal a, a target of contempt as it used to be. So, um, Things change. Well, I found this useful from the, the feedback I've gotten here, so I need to make some updates to my slides and find some place to put them so I don't have to type them in again. I had this was, uh, I had basically um, this presentation was on my Red Hat laptop and my left Red Hat, they kept it, including the presentation. So I had, I had, I gave this uh, at Confu in Montreal in 2018. So I had to watch the video and create slides <laughs> from watching the video. Added a few things. You know, um, Roy Fielding. Uh, made fun of me for being worried about Y2K. So he'll probably make fun of me for being concerned about the, the evaporation of the cloud in the case of uh, EMP attacks. And he'll probably be just as right as he was before. It won't happen. Okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call it quits. So I went from, uh, since I, I started late, and I think I probably went late. We'll call that. Uh, we'll call that even. Thank you very much for those of you who attended. I, I appreciate your ears and your eyes. Hope I haven't offended either. And um, go forth. Be excellent to each other. Be productive. And. Uh, Make a buddy. One thing I one thing I am going to throw in here, I was with an organization called Decus for many years, uh, and I was approached at the end party uh, by somebody who said <clears throat> he, he was very upset. He said he had brought somebody to the conference uh, to meet people, and since I'd been involved for a long time, I was basically foregathered with a lot of um, old timers. And that woke me up to the fact that um, the old timers should go and make a buddy of a new timer. Mentor people. Don't just stick amongst yourselves. Yeah. So that's not in here. It's, you know, not exactly relating to culture. It's just, uh, well, maybe it is. I have to think about that. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody. Have a Today is Wednesday. Have a good rest of the week and then have a good weekend. And I hope everybody stays uninfected.